morning. Welcome from my side as well. Uh, I think talking like this is okay, right? I mean, given the size of the room, but we're not too many people. Um, uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, I learned that uh, you have uh, quite some different backgrounds, uh, which is always exciting. I hope I can uh, tell you something interesting for all your new positions that you're in. Uh, my name is Leon Hirtz. Uh, I work for a boutique uh, advisory firm here in Berlin. Um, we do energy economics consulting for the private and the public sector, so uh, if you're interested in buying our services, uh, please feel free to contact us anytime. Uh, here, just for the records, you got the slides, um, and I assume you also get the updated slides. Here, just for the records for reading at home, a few of our key reference projects that we did over the last years uh, with uh, uh, some of the uh, world-class uh, public and private sector clients. Um, let me start with a few words on uh, what is, I think, fair to be called the wind and solar cost revolution. Um, this is a slide taken from um, a, a recent IA study where the IA collected different uh, renewable energy tender results. So this is the price that people bid to supply renewable energy, wind and solar power. And uh, of course, you're aware of the record-breaking tenders that have been taking place in the UAE, in Chile, um, but also recently in the Netherlands and Germany regarding offshore wind. Why is that the case? Why is renewable energy so much cheaper than a few years ago? Um, there's four important factors to do this. The first and foremost factor, which everyone has in mind, of course, is cheaper technology. Because there's a strong competition and technological progress, solar panels and wind turbines have become cheaper. But there's more. Um, there is a, a pretty strong reduction on M cost, particularly in, in wind power. Um, and maybe more important, there is a strong reduction of interest rate in the cost of capital. If, if a capital intensive technology like wind and solar power um, has access to cheaper capital, reduced, reduced WAC, then of course um, the, the outputs um, is much cheaper. Uh, and finally, um, with different technology, and I'm going to talk more about this with different technology, and particularly so-called low wind speed turbines, um, the capacity factor of renewable energy has improved uh, considerably over the last years. So rough estimates indicate that these four factors are of similar importance um, here on the upper right corner for wind power, while for solar power, the steep decrease in panel prices sort of is, is the most important driver of costs, and the others are secondary. Um, here's a little data on, on cost development of solar cells and, and wind power. Um, of course, uh, in this room, everyone is well aware of the dramatic reductions of solar module prices uh, over the last couple of years. Um, uh, maybe maybe less um, well known to all of us who were in the industry, who, who haven't been in the industry 15 years ago, is the fact that between 2000 and 2008, there was an actually t uh, decade long steep increase in the prices of wind turbines. So I bring this as a warning. We're all happy that costs go down, but this is not a, this is not a natural law. Costs can go up as well if, if supply is tight, if natural resources become more expensive, if steel becomes more expensive, etc. Um, here's data that the Department of Energy from the United States published uh, back in the times when they still talked about renewable energy um, um, uh, that sort of gives you a feeling how strongly the decrease in O&M cost for wind turbines is. Um, notice this scale on the y-axis y starts at zero, so you really, you really see a decrease of O&M costs that's, that's very dramatic over a very long time period of uh, 30 years or so. Similarly, you're all aware that cost of capital went down. We are at record low interest rates still in historical time frames. We have, lost the neg we have left the negative interest rate range, but we're still at very low interest rates. And it, 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 if, if you talk about uh, technologies like wind and solar power that almost entirely consist of capital costs, a reduce of WAC immediately um, turns out in a dramatic reduction of output costs, for example, measured in levelized electricity costs. And this gives wind and solar an advantage versus technologies that are less capital intensive, like gas power plants, gas-fired power plants. Natural gas-fired power plants are less intensive in their investments, hence they benefit, they also benefit from low interest rate, of course, but they benefit to a lesser degree. So the relative competitiveness of wind versus fossil improves um, if interest rates go down, and, and that's what happened over the last 10 years. 
And finally, I want to point you to, to an observation that's also not so well known, at least not in the policy arena, that the capacity that wind turbine technology has changed dramatically. Not only cost went down, but the, the way turbines are designed and layouted today is very different to 20 years ago, which as one consequence has increased the capacity factor from 20 or so percent, uh, way above 30 percent on global average in terms of new installation. Uh, um, last year, and, um, and this also has consequences uh, for the so-called market value of wind power, which I, I'll come back to in about 20 minutes or so. Taking these, these changes together, the dramatic cost decline driven by four factors, plus a widespread support of renewable energy that, that is now taking place in nearly uh, every country of the world has led to a quite dramatic growth of capacity. On the left-hand side, you see uh, figures that combine um, sort of um, actual numbers from the IEA with forecasts from REN21, and you see um, we have combined wind and solar power capacity to today, a tremendous capacity installed globally of around 500 gigawatts, which might well double until the end of the decade. Translated into shares of electricity produced, um, in most countries of the world, we talk about zero to two percent of electricity produced by renewable energy. In that sense, we haven't seen the revolution yet. But in some countries, um, to study sort of power systems under stress of high shares of variable renewables, these are countries to look at. Of course, there's other regions of the world as well, um, Eastern Mongolia, Texas, California. But if you talk about uh, countries, um, these are the countries that have the highest share of, of wind and solar combined. And of the, um, of the 33 IEA member countries, there's 10 countries that, that's, that's, that have surpassed the 10% threshold. Uh, world leader, of course, is Denmark, but also Ireland and the Iberian Peninsula countries um, are pretty, uh, pretty strong. Um, sort of this is, was uh, the warm-up from my side. Um, if you look at these numbers, you might get the impression the climate problem has been solved. Costs are so low that, that wind and solar will just take over the game and, and uh, um, uh, fossil fuels will um, um, leave, leave the market and re electricity is so cheap that everything is, is, is run on electricity, including transport and heating and cooling. So climate is all set, question mark. Um, with this introduction cost, I, I, I would like to turn on my own research and I would very much encourage you to, 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 to make this a interactive exercise. So whenever you have comments, questions, concerns, if you disagree, uh, just jump in and raise your hands. Uh, go ahead, please. We have the chance by the same one. If you go one slide back, there was a peak with Denmark, but you can see in the last year it was going down. Well, how can this effect be explained? For the very simple reason that wind speeds have been lower in Denmark last year. So if, you, if the growth rates and capacity are not tremendous, then of course the year-to-year -year variation in wind speeds uh, um, uh, 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 factor in here. Um, and, and I mean, if you look at the time series, you have seen one, two, three, four, five, six cases where uh, the share of electricity production went down uh, on a year-to-year -year basis. Uh, I know I, I work a little bit on Denmark, and it's pretty pretty certain that this is not a not a break in the, it's not a structural break in the trend, but just a one-year dip. I have a question on uh, I think a slide before that uh, on the CO2. Uh, maybe, this one? No, this one. So is the CO2 um, is the whole life cycle cost? Ah, uh, here on the right-hand side. Yeah. Um, This is uh, the the CO2 emissions in operations, but but I, I didn't want I didn't mean to. It is taken from a from a published paper, so I didn't change that. But don't focus here on the point is here not so much the different CO2 levels. I mean you all know that coal-fired power plants emit more CO2 than wind turbines. That wasn't my news. The point here is that what's important here is the size of the blue bar. As a share of total cost, wind and solar power almost only consist of upfront investment costs, while gas and coal-fired power plants have shares between 40 and 60 percent. So if you reduce capital costs, which reduces the, 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 the levelized investment costs, wind and solar benefit much more than fossil fuels. 
And if you take this picture and combine it with the right-hand picture of the downward trend of capital costs, then you see that uh, the, the slow interest rate environment that we live in this, uh, these days has been very beneficial uh, for, for renewables. And of course, this is a warning also, this might change. We might come back to, we might go back to 8% interest rate in a couple of years. Who knows? I don't. If that happens, renewables will become much less competitive vis-a-vis -vis, uh, fossil fuels. So, so this again is a warning that this is not a one-way street. It's not an iron law that renewables become cheaper and fossils become more expensive. That might flip again. Say it again, which slide? This one? Regarding the cost of modules, even at the end of 2016, the Chinese modules average price dropped to maybe 35, 36 dollar cents. And even the German modules were a little bit. So this, this are module prices at German imports, uh, including the, the, the tax that the European Union applies. And this is, uh, uh, runs only up until September 2016. The last year or so has, been, has seen another drop. So if you update the figure, you, you would see a little further dip. And if you, uh, That's right. The, the previous the couple of slides. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. The this one? Yes. I, I would say one important factor uh, also uh, is the competition, it's the severe competition I in agree. the market, because the market is booming, it's really booming too much and everyone wants to, to have a footstep, to have a reference. Uh, I agree, money. I agree. Uh, and of course competition, I'm an economist, so I, I think competition is a good thing and I, I think what you see here Factors one, two, and four are, of course, all driven by competition. Why do we get better wind turbines today? Well, because there's competing manufacturers that want to design, that want to make profit, sell turbines, and hence they try to make better turbines. So in a sense, competition is sort of an underlying uh, theme here, I think. OK, let's move on. So I'm asking the admittedly provocative question so is the, private, is the climate problem solved? And maybe it's not so provocative because many Germans do believe, oh yeah, with wind and solar becoming cheaper, everything is fine. I couldn't disagree more. The main point, this is maybe the most important message that I, I want to deliver today. If we talk about the economics of anything, including wind and solar power, we need to look at the cost of these things and the value that their production output has. In economic terms, the long-term level of wind power, if Q stands for the share of wind power in the market or solar power, um, what share of the market will wind power capture in the long term? Well, that is defined by the intersection of long-term marginal cost and long-term marginal benefits. This is sort of economics 101. Uh, that's what you usually start with in microeconomics um, uh, in an introductory uh, class. And uh, this, is, uh, this applies to all markets, including the electricity markets. The long-term marginal cost of wind power is what we often uh, define as levelized energy costs, LEC or LCOE. Uh, and the long-term marginal value might be called market value. And I want to talk more about this. So a uh, drop in costs, which here is reflected by a shift of the marginal cost curve downwards, does not mean that renewables will capture the entire market or even a large share of the market. How much they capture depends crucially on the level and the, and the steepness and the gradient of the marginal value curve on the market value curve. And we're going to talk about the market value curve a lot to today. So just because wind power is cheaper, um, a megawatt hour of wind power is cheaper than a megawatt hour of coal fired or gas fired electricity by itself won't give you any information about the role of wind power in the future. It does not mean that wind power is able to compete on the market with, um, with coal or gas-fired power plants because we need to factor in the differences in economic value of the electricity that they produce. So I would like to give you answers or at least discuss with you three questions. First, uh, sort of the more descriptive one is what is the economic value of wind and solar energy? Second one, what can we do about it? How can we make it improve? And third, what implications does this have for, for electricity market design and 
um, energy policy. So let me first talk about the wind and solar value drop. Um, I, I want to start with some fundamentals about electricity markets. This is the electricity price in Germany in one week of last year. Um, the important takeaway here is that the electricity prices varies and fluctuates strongly at very short time scales. So this is an hourly resolution chart of one week and you see that sometimes electricity prices are high, sometimes they are low, sometimes they are zero, sometimes they are negative. So if you want to know what your electricity generation assets, a wind turbine, a fossil fuel plant, a solar power assets, is worth, you need to know when is it producing electricity. So if you have an asset that only produces, that, that is for free, it produces electricity for free, but it only can produce electricity when prices are negative, you wouldn't build it. It's for free, but you wouldn't take it because its, it's revenue uh, is negative. So, so how does it play out for wind power? What I calculated here was the um, so-called, and this is numbers from Germany, but you could do this for any other electricity markets that's, liberal, that's liberalized, that has, a, has a, a wholesale market and a price. I went back for, uh, for 15 years um, and looked at the average price of all hours, the so-called base price in 2001, which turns out to be uh, slightly above 23 euros. And then I calculated hour by hour how much wind energy was produced and what was the average revenue per megawatt hour of wind energy over the course of the year 2001, which turns out, out to be slightly below 23 euros. If you take the ratio of the second over the first, you get what I call the value factor. That's the relative price of wind energy compared to the average electricity price, which was 96% that year. 14 years fast forward. <coughs> The average price of electricity was 32 euros, wind revenues was 27, so the ratio of that two had dropped to 85%. Visualize the same data on a graph. On the x-axis you see here the market share of wind and solar power, again this is data for Germany, in, in terms of annual electricity generation. And on the y, and, and wind is blue here and solar is yellow. And on the y-axis you see the average revenue of these technologies, again normalized by the average electricity price. What you see here is what you would expect as an econom economist that if you increase the supply of something, wind energy, its price drops. And the message here is that it doesn't only drop, it's, it's drop it drops at a speed that's pretty concerning. So if you extrapolate these uh, best fits here, these dotted lines, you end up at pretty low values economic values for only moderate market shares of wind energy. So I guess, I believe the most decisive questions for the long-term economic success and, and mere existence of wind and solar energy is how, how do these curves develop when we go farther to the right axis? And because there aren't any large countries with very high shares, Denmark is not a good case because it's so well interconnected to all the other countries so you can't really can't really look at it in isolation. Um, um, we, need to do, um, we need to think about that more fundamentally and, and use uh, other methods than just looking at market data. So the method I use is built on the, on, on the so-called um, um, uh, um, merit order model of electricity markets. Um, and in its simplest version, it's, it's, uh, it's like this. Um, this is the short-term supply curve of electricity that comes from thermal electricity generators that exist on the market and they are ordered by a, a marginal cost. And where this merit order curve intersects with the demand curve, the load curve, um, the market clearing or equilibrium electricity price of a particular hour emerges. So what happens if there's wind power in that hour? Well, if there's wind energy produced in that hour, the, the demand served by fossils is demand net of wind power, demand minus wind power or residual loads. And obviously this is less and hence we get a reduced electricity price. This is the mechanics of the value drop. This is why systematically, not by coincidence, systematically wind and energy will, will get a lower price than others. And the more of these technologies are in the market, the lower their, their revenue will be. Because this, this, if you don't have 20 gigawatts of wind power in the market, but 40, it's obvious that the price drop will be steeper. So translating this into something that we can, we can use to learn something about the future um, is seen on this page. But here the question first. Yeah, I'm trying to uh, distinguish whether 
this value drop in wind and solar is basically tracking this macro thing, which is that the, just the price of electricity is dropping, and the question is, is coal and fossil fuel um, electricity is also, the market value of those uh, sources of energy is also dropping, and then, you know, there's a correlation. Yes, it's absolutely right. Just looking at absolute revenues over the last, well, since 2010 wouldn't, would only tell you that everyone has earned much less than. So if I go buy this technology, for example, in the 80s, the computer would cost 10,000. I agree, but I agree. Hold on one second. That's why I don't do this. That's why I don't do look, I, I do not look, this, this figure does not give you the absolute revenue of wind power. Then you would see uh, th this figure here. Then you would see a very, very steep, steep drop. But what I, what I do here is I normalize, I divide year by year. I look at what, does, what did wind power earn and what was the average price. And I take the, the ratio of those two. So I control for the fact that the overall level of electricity prices went down. Well, in some years it also went up. Look at, I start with 2001, so we saw 10 years of increasing prices and 10 years of, well, eight years of decreasing prices and leveling off. But I control for this by dividing by the yearly average. Otherwise, you would see sort of an increase and then a decrease. And we wouldn't learn much. I very much agree with you. But we would learn about the electricity crisis, but not so much about the technology. So if we, if we want to talk about the, the, the future, get some reliable um, results, of course, this little figure is not enough. We need to factor in more details of the electricity system. We need to account for the fact that there's countries and there's interconnection between countries, um, that, they, that the profiles, the generation patterns of wind and solar are different from in Spain and in southern Germany, from Sweden, um, that there is um, CHP plants, that, the, that the, in France there's more nuclear plants, and in Poland there is none. Um, um, and so on and so forth. We need to factor in that some power plants need to be running all the time in electricity markets to, to provide balancing services and other system services, yada, 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 you name it. Electricity systems are complex and these complexities matter for price formation. So in my PhD 10 years ago, I built this uh, numerical um, power market model of, of Central Northern Europe, which I applied to this question here. Um, by the way, the model is open source, so if you want to have a look at it, if you want to use it, you're free to do so. Uh, you can download it uh, for free and, and run it um, um, uh, anytime. And you can, and if you if you try to replicate this exercise and the results are different, let me know. Maybe maybe I made a mistake. Um, so I, I want to show you two core outcomes of this model exercise. Uh, they've been published in a 2013 paper in Energy Economics, uh, which, which has been sort of uh, changing. Um, I think it's fair to say that this paper has changed the debate in, uh, in the international sphere about the economics of wind and solar um, significantly. And these are the core results. On the left-hand side, again, what, what I plot here is the same figure as, as the market data. On the x-axis, you see the market share in percent in terms of annual energy production. On the y-axis, you see the normalized market value. So the, the market value of wind power relative to the average electricity price. No surprise, we see a drop. But what is important here um, is the size of the drop. Um, this is roughly a 40% drop in value for wind energy on the left-hand side as you go from 0 to 30%. So one, the same megawatt hour of wind power is worth 40% less if there's 30% wind energy in the market compared to 0% wind energy in the market. It's the same megawatt hour. It has the same characteristics, but it's worth 40% less. And that's obviously no good news for wind power. For solar power, the drop is even steeper. Here in the model, um, we estimate the drop to be 50% for, for an increase of market share from 0 to only 15%. So the x-axis here are different. Why does solar energy drop even more in value than wind energy? Well, because solar energy is more compressed. It's, it's more concentrated in fewer hours of the year. For the simple fact that at night there's no sun and in winter there's less sun. So, um, so solar energy is produced in, in only, not a handful, but a couple of hundred hours of the year, most solar energy is produced. And in that hours, the, this value dropping effect that I illustrated on the merit order curve is particularly strong. Yes. Isn't this value artificially dropped by the fact that it's subsidized? Well, it's 
what, what I do in the model is I just say, assume that there's a certain amount of wind power in the market, 0, 10, 20, 30 percent, and let the model optimize the rest of the power system. In a sense, what I do model is some sort of subsidy, but it doesn't need to be a subsidy. You could also think, if what happens if the cost of wind turbines drop far enough to deliver 30% wind energy without any subsidies, then we would get to the exact same value. So the assumption is not a subsidy explicitly, but the assumption is a certain market share of wind power. The question here, sort of, sort of this is the question that I have. What's the market value at a given share of wind power? I don't, really, I don't really care at this moment. I don't care how do we get there. Could be subsidy, could be market driven, could just fall from the sky, um, which would be surprising, I admit. Uh, but, but that's sort of not the, not the purpose of this slide. It's more a what if analysis. Does it mean that you just ready to pay more for storage? If you put it in the other round? Let, me, let me come to storage in a se for, for a second. Of course, if we could, if we could, if we had a, if we had a storage device that's 100% efficient, doesn't cost anything, uh, and is avail available in infinite amounts, then this line would be a horizontal line. Then there wouldn't be any value drop. That's the extreme case. Um, so let's have a look at some more realistic assumptions. So let's, for example, look at the storage that we have, the only large-scale storage that we have in Europe at this moment, um, pumped hydro storage. So what if the pumped hydro storage in France and in Germany and Austria is taken away from the, from the model, and in a different case, it's just doubled in size. This is the effect that you have. Blue is no storage at all, and orange is double storage size, so the dotted line would be in between those two. And the takeaway here is doubling pumped hydro storage capacity doesn't change much of the picture. It changes something as expected, but the quantitative effect is just very small. This paper was written before the dramatic drop in uh, lithium iron battery costs, but, but even at current and foreseeable price of lithium iron batteries, these batteries will have a large role uh, as standalone uh, devices and power systems, but more in system service provision than in, in large volume energy storage. So I still think that storage will not be a major part of the solution to this problem in the next 20 or 30 or 40 years. But there are more options. And another option that, that is very obvious is, well, let's just connect countries better. Of course, there's times when there's no wind at all in Europe. But most of the times when there's no wind in Germany, there's some wind in Sweden. If there's no wind in Sweden, there's some wind in Poland. So if we increase interconnection, we smooth out variation, and we improve the economics of wind power for that simple fact. Um, and this is depicted here on the, on the right-hand side. So what if we cut all countries? and make all countries electrical islands, then we would get lower economic value of wind power. If we improve uh, interconnection capacity by twice, so we double interconnection capacity between countries, we get the orange line. Effect here is stronger, but it still doesn't change the picture, really. Even with double storage and double interconnection capacity, you would still get a value drop of wind and solar power that's pretty concerning in Europe. Of course, this is all assumption driven. Of course, we took a specific assumption in the model about things like the CO2 price, the demand level, energy efficiency, the prices of uh, natural gas, of coal, of, of power plants, the investment cost of anything in the model, the cost of interconnection, and, and, and you name it. If you change these assumptions, results will change. To be sure that we are here on, a, on the right track, we uh, overall ran um, more than 500 model runs, uh, changing all kinds of assumptions. And, and, and here in Dotted, you see the same line that you saw before in, in the, this gray shaded area is the entire range of uh, results that we, that we got from this variation of assumptions. So that's what we call a parameter uncertainty range that gives you the maximum and the minimum value of value factor that, that you could get. The maximum value is a world where you have a lot of storage, a lot of interconnection, very flexible power plants, and the lowest value is a world where we have no storage, no interconnection, and very inflexible power plants. So I'm not saying that the value factor of wind power will be 0 0.7 uh, at 30%, but I, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty certain that it will be somewhere in the range between 50 and 80% at 30% market share. So we can do a lot to improve, to mitigate the value drop, but it will be there. It cannot be discussed away. It will happen, and it's happening now. And I don't need to tell you this. Um, this is, of course, bad news 
for anyone who's investing in renewables, anyone who's paying for support schemes, um, anyone who's interested in climate, and it's also bad news for the renewable energy industry. Um, what do others say? Uh, to be sure that I'm not, I'm not talking nonsense here, um, we've looked at about 100 published studies and tried to extract from these studies metrics that we can compare. Uh, and here and again on the, on the x-axis you see the market share, on the y-axis you see the value factor, um, as derived from a number of publications. And you see that with different models, with different assumptions, with different um, geographic regions, we get different results. But the overall picture is consistent. Every single study confirms that with increasing penetration, the value drops. And every single study finds a pretty significant drop in value. This is for wind power. So let me briefly summarize. At high penetration rates of wind and solar power, um, the energy that they produce is relatively low value compared to other generators and compared to the value that had, it had at low penetration rates. Um, we, we estimate about 40% drop uh, for wind is going from 0 to 30%. Um, we believe this is pretty robust with respect to both um, parameter uncertainty and model uncertainty. Um, and that raises important questions in policy and, and puts ambitious renewable targets and ambitious climate targets in jeopardy. Um, don't, don't get me too pessimistic here. I'm not saying we are doomed. I'm saying it's going to be more tricky than we thought a few years ago. And I'm also saying I think we can make it. And I, I try to give you some um, sort of outlines of what, what might help here. Broadly speaking, I think you can, there, there's many, many things you can do about this and you can make things better. Broadly speaking, there's two type of, two classes of actions that you can take. First is you, you can think of the power system. You, you try to make the power system better suited for high shares of renewable energy. And one option is storage, another option is inter, uh, uh, um, uh, interconnection. Uh, really important actions in Europe is also making existing power plants more flexible, making, making the supply of heat in combined heat and power plants and making the supply of ancillary services more flexible um, uh, by reducing mass run of thermal power plants. Um, an important aspect is also shifting the thermal generation mix towards low capital intensive technologies. In a high renewable world, we don't need any baseload plants anymore. We don't need lignite plants, we don't need nuclear plants. What we need is plants that run 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 hours of the year and that are pretty cheap to build. These are probably biomass or natural gas-fired power plants or something along these lines, but no baseload. And finally, there's uh, an option that we studied in a paper in detail. I can provide you with the, with the references if you like. Um, make use of the existing flexible hydro resources that we have in many places of the world. We have a lot in the Western US, we have a lot in Africa, we have a lot in Scandinavia, and we have a lot in China. And these power plants are able to store energy uh, to produce electricity when it's, when it's more needed, when it's higher value, so we should make use of that. Um, on the other hand, the second class of action that we can take is not thinking about the power system, but thinking about the technology itself, thinking about the wind turbine, and here we can, or, or the solar, solar cell. And here, broadly speaking, we can, we can do different things. We can try to put wind and solar power where they produce electricity that's higher value. We can try to get the optimal mix between wind, onshore, offshore winds, solar, maybe ocean energy, and maybe other technologies to sort of compensate each other for the fluctuations. Um, we can try to, 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 to build solar power such that they produce electricity when it's more needed. For example, rotate them to the west such that they produce more in the evening hours. And um, maybe most importantly, we can think about designing wind turbines differently. We can, make, we can build wind turbines that produce electricity that's higher value. And that's what I want to come to next. We've classified these actions into classes and one we call system renewable system, renewables friendly power systems, and the other option is a power system friendly renewable technology. So let me talk about system friendly renewables next. But first of all, uh, is there any comments or questions? Uh, uh, sort of the, the, what, what, what I talked you through is sort of the basis for the next. So if you, if you have concerns about what you've just saw, then please raise your hand and let's discuss that because what's coming next builds on that. And, and modifies the analysis. All right. 
Oh, yeah, sorry. This is, of course, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the options what, 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 what you could subsumize under making the power system more flexible. Um, in our model assessment, we haven't, and I believe we haven't for good reasons. I think these technologies are, are for, the, for the foreseeable future, and I mean 2050, highly uneconomic. Um, but there's people who disagree, particularly in Germany, and some of the studies that I referenced do that. Some of these studies include includes, uh, um, power to gas in particular, um, 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 but still find sort of this is not the silver bullet. It helps mitigating the value drop, but it's not the silver bullet technology that makes it go away. Yes? Before we come to uh, power to gas, I think we can take into account power to heat, like heat pumps or direct electric heating. Would you take something like this into account? <laughs> Uh, yeah, when we talk heat in, in northern Germany and uh, in northern Europe, this is an uh, uh, this is an important topic. I think globally, it's it's less uh, less of importance, uh, be simply because heating demand on global scale isn't isn't as high as in the northern northern part of Europe. Um, we have and, and there's I think there's two interesting aspects of the heat electricity interface. One is where these things are combined produced at the same time, uh, which is combined heat and power plants. Uh, which also gives you sort of a fix or a, an inflexible link between heat and, and electricity. Mm -hmm. And the other option is producing heat from electricity through direct heating or heat pumps or so. We have modeled the first but not the second one. Okay. So we have, we have modeled a case where combined heat and power plants are flexible, made flexible through means of uh, heat storage, but we haven't modeled here um, uh, um, uh, flexible heat demand. I'm doing this at this moment with a master student who's sort of amending the model, building that, uh, building, building sort of, uh, sort of an extension, uh, trying to model heat pumps and heat, heat demands. Uh, uh, his results are not too encouraging, though. So, so he, what he finds is a relatively limited impact. To what extent do you take ocean energy in account? Not at all. That was an easy question. Uh, I haven't, I haven't looked at it at all. Yeah. And uh, the, the slide uh, titled "The Drop Value Continues" is, this is for the same time period, uh, 2001 to 2015, or this year. This is not about any particular year. So what we did here is sort of modeling different long-term equilibria, and uh, so what, what I told the model is. What you, what you take for given is that there's 30% wind energy in the system, and all the rest is up to you. Build a power system that's cost minimal for this assumption, and then I calculated the price and the, and the value factor, and then I, I scrapped the model and I, I, I did a second run saying, okay, now take for granted that we have 20% wind energy in the system. Build a complete perfect system, and I calculate the, the, um, the value factor, and so on. So this is sort of a number of long-term equilibria and not any particular year um, uh, of the future or the past. So system-friendly renewables. What's that? This is technologies that reduce the integration cost or social uh, total system cost, that increase the economic value of electricity produced, and hence reduces the support cost for renewable energy. If you think this definition through, the, you, you will see that they all um, uh, uh, mean the same. Um, what do we mean by this, technology-wise? Um, this is the, the power curves of two wind turbines that have been sold on the market very successfully over the last years. The Enercon E83 uh, with a capacity of 3 megawatts and the Vestas V100 with a capacity of 1.8 megawatts. On an average German wind farm, these two turbines would produce about the same amount of electrical energy over the course of the year. One is a power plant that has a relatively small rotor, but a large electrical generator, and one is a power plant that has a large rotor and a small generator. So when it's high wind speeds, um, the Enercon produces more because it has more capacity. If it's low wind speeds, the Vestas turbine produces more because it has, uh, it has a higher larger diameter of the rotor so it can harvest more energy. Overall, on the a, on a course of the year, these two factors balance out in the sense of 
energy produced. But the point here is that the energy that these two plants produce has not the same economic value. The Vestas turbine will produce energy that has a higher economic value. Um, so for, for this model exercise, which was a study that we did in conjunction with the system uh, integration, uh, uh, renewable energy system integration unit at the IEA in Paris, um, we compared um, two turbines, um, uh, a class, what we called a classical turbine and advanced turbine, and what the, what's different between these turbines is that they have a different height of the, of uh, different hub heights, and that they have a different layout, a different specific rating. A classical turbine is a, it's a turbine that has a capacity factor of about 20%, and for the same size, the advanced turbine, a low wind speed turbine, has a capacity factor of about 40%, because it has, has a larger, a larger diameter, larger, longer blades. And because of the precise fact that I just explained, the advanced turbine has a smoother output of electricity over the course of the year, while the classical turbine fluctuates more widely between high wind and low wind speed times. Put differently, you could also say that the advanced turbine spills energy because at higher wind speeds it cannot, it cannot turn all the energy that it harvests into electrical energy because of the limited capacity of the generator and the power electronics. So that's the a negative way of looking, things, looking at things. So far, so known. What's new and what's important is, is that the economic value of output is different. So this is a very similar figure that you have seen, x-axis wind share and y-axis value factor, but here it's assumed that in one case, the boat line, all, all wind turbines in Europe are conventional classical design, and that's compared to a case in dotted where all wind turbines are low wind speed turbines that have high capacity factors, what we call advanced design. It turns out that because they produce electricity much more constantly, the economic value of electricity they produce is higher. And it's significantly higher. If you compare that to the figures that we, that we saw on the impact of storage or interconnection, you see that this difference here really matters. Uh, in numbers, we estimate that there's a 30% market share, that there's an 11 percentage point gap between these two cases. In other words, that switching from a world where everything is conventional to a world where everything is low wind speed turbines, you would increase the, by this change only, you would increase the value of wind energy per megawatt hour by 15%. Um, or uh, said differently, um, you, would, you would reduce the value drop from about 40% to less than 30%. So you would, you would by this alone, you would, uh, you would mitigate a quarter of the value drop. And of course, this could be combined with storage and combined with making the system and should be combined with making the power system more flexible. So I'm not saying this is the only solution, but I'm saying this is a very important uh, solution that is, uh, has been often overlooked in the debate. And there's more good news. Um, this increase in, in wholesale market value that I just discussed is not the only benefit that these turbines have. Another economic benefit is that they tend to produce less forecast errors. I mean, if you, if you compare two fleets of turbines of the same, that produce the same share of energy, the same amount of energy per year, um, then a fleet of low wind speed turbines will give you, because it fluctuates, fluctuates less, it will give you also less forecast errors, and less forecast errors means reduced cost for balancing. Um, and there's more good news to come. It's not only these two factors. A third factor is a reduced cost in, 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 in connecting and expanding the electricity grids. Um, very roughly speaking, the cost of grid expansion is proportionate or is a function of installed capacity and not produced energy. If you, if you have turbines that have twice the capacity factor, then for the same amount of energy, you only need half the capacity. That means you only need half the grid connection. Of course, <coughs> grid connection costs in reality are not a linear function, but as a first approximation, and just to give you an idea about the size of factors that we talk about here. Um, the problem with traditional support schemes, uh, or, or maybe I should say by now past support schemes, like traditional feed-in tariffs is that they do not provide any incentive to investors to invest in smart, system-friendly renewables. 
you just get a payment per energy unit produced. You get a payment in dollars per megawatt hour, and that's it. You don't care if you produce high value, low value, forecast errors, no forecast errors, high, low grid connection cost. You just produce as much energy for as little cost that you, that, that you can get. Um, this is visualized on this, on this graph here. If you switch the, uh, uh, the support scheme to a system that's, that, that provides better incentive, to a system that gives the investor the market price plus a markup, things like uh, Germany's feed in premium or, or um, Sweden's or, or the former British system of certificates or the American system of tax credits, production investment tax credits, all these systems have in common that they leave the market's price signals intact and they deliver the price signals to the renewable energy investor. And this is a good thing. This will make the investor produce or invest in more system-friendly equipment. So let me briefly summarize um, uh, uh, this section here. Uh, the, the, what uh, some observers have called the silent revolution has really changed the way wind turbines have been built. And I, I would like to emphasize that this is nothing fancy fancy about the future. This is happening right now. What I showed you was modeling results based on wind turbines that you can buy today on the market. So we didn't make wind turbines up. We went to the, uh, to the manufacturer's home pages and looked at their power curves and compared different cases. Um, this leads to higher spot market value, reduced balancing costs, reduced grid costs. We think we estimate that the increase um, uh, is significant and large. And, um, and this has implications for policy and market design. Um, roughly speaking, support policy should make sure that all market price signals are transmitted to investors, that they're not blocked from the market price signals. And the market should be designed as such that price signals really correspond to the true economic value of things. And let me talk about, uh, about this um, in the last couple of minutes. What are implications for market design of electricity market and electricity policy? Um, so when we talk about market design, we, we should start with some reflection on what is good. What is good market design and what's not good market design? And of course, there's disagreement on that. If you're an investor in a, in a nuclear power plant, then good market design is what makes you thrive. And if you're an investor in renewable energy, then a good market design is what gives you good profits for renewable energy. I'm an economist. I think good market design is what, what maximizes social welfare, what's good for societies. Or more, in, in policy jargon, I, I would say, good market design is what gives you cheap and reliable electricity to societies without harming the environment and health. Um, this can be specified and spelled out more. This is uh, work we've done with the uh, French colleagues on, um, uh, for the uh, IEA RETD um, in a study on market design. Um, and you can go into details and sort of spell out what does economic welfare mean in electricity markets and derive a lot of criteria. And if you apply them and think them through, you come to the following conclusions. Um, when we talk about support schemes, um, renewable energy support schemes need to acknowledge that renewable energy is not renewable energy. Wind power is not wind power. Wind energy is not wind energy. There's different types, and they have different economic value, and that need to be, ref need to be reflected in the, in the incentive that they get. Um, I think the best way of doing this, of course, you could, you could design a feed-in tariff where you get more money for a system-friendly than for a system-unfriendly turbine, and the difference is determined by some experts. I don't think that's a good idea. I think that's, that, that should be done in markets. That's what markets are there for. So we should design energy support policy, renewable energy support policy as such that market signals are transmitted to investors. And then markets should be designed such that they signal scarcity, particularly in space and in time. So electricity wholesale prices need to be allowed to rise very high if there's very tight, de tight supply. So um, it's OK if the price of energy rises to 5,000 or even 10,000 euros per megawatt hour in a specific hour if that's, the, if that's what, willing, what people are willing to pay not to be, not to be curtailed. Um, and similarly, I think we, uh, particularly in Europe, we really think, need to think more thoroughly about how to reflect geographic locational scarcity. You know that entire Germany is one price uh, bidding zone in, uh, on the wholesale electricity markets. 
um, um, and this this market design um, implies that that all electric, all electricity is is worth the same across Germany, but that's not true. There is a situation when electricity is abundant in the north but scarce in the south, and that should and needs to be reflected somehow uh, in long-term price um, uh, uh, market design. That's not an easy debate. I'm not saying I have the silver bullet here. Just splitting the market in two zones has a lot of disadvantages, um, but we really need to think about this. Um, on the on the area of balancing energy market, the same theme applies. We should we, we need to allow price or signal scarcity, and that we, that means we need to let market players enter that market, and we need to let prices be set freely and also become very high if needed. Um, and um, a theme that's related to the locational value is the the topic of grid charges. I also believe that grid charges should be. Um, um, sort of the difference in, differences in, in grid costs should be so somehow need to be seen by investors. So if I have an option of, of building um, wind power in two places, and one place is slightly cheaper to build, but has huge connection and, and expansion, grid expansion costs involved, as an investor, I don't care. I just build there, even though it's bad for society, because, because it's, it's, uh, it's consumers who pay for, uh, for grid expansion. And that needs to change. Um, a particular debate, and I assume this is controversial here in this room, uh, and that's why I put the slide in the deck, is uh, net, balance, net metering uh, and all kind of auto-generation self-consumption schemes. It's my, uh, it's my conviction that, that net metering and self-consumption is a pretty bad idea for the particular reason that, that pretty much all scarcity signals and all information that's on the prices of the wholesale markets are lost. Because if I optimize my own electricity production against the retail price, I get a very high price, I pay it for the, for the entire time of the year, I, I, I don't respond to any scarcity signals of the system, um, and hence I do something that's economically speaking from, this, from the perspective of the power system, uh, very uh, highly suboptimal. So I believe net metering um, is, is distortive and up to the point where I'd say it's dangerous. And I'm not only talking about net metering of solar PV, of small scale rooftop solar PV. In the German case, auto generation is much more an issue of large scale industrial producers that build gas fired power plants in their in industry parks. Um, and uh, this is uh, uh, in terms of volume more important than solar PV at this moment. Um, so here's a, a few ideas um, how things could change to, to, um, to, to make the, uh, the, the incentives for people who produce electricity in themselves uh, more aligned with society. Um, um, uh, we can discuss that if you'd like. Um, I would close with the last slides, uh, trying to uh, formalize some uh, uh, formulate some take-home messages uh, for you today. So if, if this is what you learn from today, I'm happy. Um, maybe the most important message first, economics has two sides. Economics is about cost and e economics is about value. And whatever policy debate you take, whatever decision you make, don't forget either of the one. For the long-term success of renewables, Value is as important as cost. I'm not saying cost doesn't matter. It's both that matters. It's the, in, it's the interplay of cost and value that will determine long-term success of the energy transition. Um, market analysis, um, I mean econometrics, power market modeling, and, uh, and um, uh, meta studies that we've done sh show that the market value of wind and solar energy drops pretty significantly with penetration. We estimate a 40% drop when going from 0 to 30% wind, and about twice that size for solar energy. Um, there is many things we can do and make this be less worse. There's system-friendly, renewable-friendly systems and system-friendly renewables, and both should be pursued, both should be done. Um, and uh, one option that we've discussed in detail today, and one option that's really promising is uh, is wind turbine design that's system friendly. Um, and sort of the high level message in terms of market design that I bring to you is markets should signal scarcity and energy policy should make sure that these signals are seen and, and responded by 
uh, investors. This work is mostly based on studies that are published uh, for the records and for, uh, for a reading at home. There's the references, these are links, and all, all these studies are freely available and uh, um, open access. Thank you very much. So I understand we have until 10.30, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, bis wann? Wann sind Sie? Viertel nach. Okay. Yeah? Okay. So, we've closed ten minutes. Uh, I mean, we've taken uh, several discussion points already. Uh, mm -hmm. If you have any more questions, comments, challenges, please go ahead. So, uh, so what's your idea for a, a good incentive system for the, the PPA price, or instead of the net metering, the, the consumption? Uh, to, to drive people, to, to investors and the private, uh, uh, private facilities to, uh, let's say, settle these uh, gaps, close these gaps. What's your, your personal idea? Um, I think there's no one size fits at all. So the question or the answer to this question depends on what country are we talking about? Where does the country sit geographically? Where does the country stand in terms of economic development, political development, market development, and also in terms of renewable development? And are we talking about 2017, 20, 2025, or are we talking about the past? Let me go back uh, uh, several slides um, and uh, uh, to illustrate this answer. So. I told you that the wind, wind value drops dramatically um, as penetration goes up. But, uh, sorry. But if we talk about a low penetration scenario, and for most countries of the world today, I guess 180 out of 190 countries in the world today are somewhere between 0 and 5% renewables. At this level, in this range here, solar power and wind power are actually roughly speaking, as much worth per megawatt hour as, as, as a constant source of electricity. So for, for the first couple of percentage points sort of to, think, to get things started, I don't think it's important to get wholesale price signals to renewables investors. Um, even a very stupid feed-in tariff, which has other advantages, for example, it's, it's easy to understand, you can explain it easily, you get a lot of investor confidence and so on. A simple feed-in tariff could be a good option for the first couple of percent. Um, I think if you talk about sort of the right-hand side of the figure, where should Europe go in 2020, 2030 or so? Where should Germany be in 10 years? I think we shouldn't have any dedicated support for renewable energy anymore. I think we should have a decent CO2 price with a clear price trajectory that's upward sloping. And then let the market decide what's the what's let the market decide what's the best low carbon technology. It will be renewables. I mean, there's it will be wind and solar power. They have sort of certainly proven that they are more cost competitive than 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 uh, nuclear power. At least when we talk about shares of twenty or forty percent. Um, so I think in the long term, uh, a CO two price should be the one and only instrument. And then in the medium, I think the way I, I, I support, I'm more familiar with the German case because I work a lot for the German government. Um, so let me, let me say something on this specific case here, not claiming that this is applicable to other countries, at least not outside Europe. I think the German way of going to tenders, where what, what you tender is a support on top of the market price, a feed-in premium, and that's tendered in a competitive tender. I think that's an appropriate support scheme where we stand for large-scale projects of 10 megawatts to 200 megawatts. I don't think, maybe it could also be applied even to smaller scale with an online auction to, to household level um, uh, uh, investors. Um, but I, I, think it, I think it makes sense. And also the, the tender results of the last couple of years have shown how successful that support scheme really is in driving down costs and, 
and sort of squeezing investors to get the best deal for society. Yes. Uh, just from technical point of view, I believe also uh, one one uh, to increase the, the value factor of the solar is maybe to add tracker for the big parts. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. Um, I actually started work on this and then stopped because another paper was published that did pretty much exactly the same, just much better than I could. Um, uh, that's people from, I'm not sure, from, from the US, from NREL, I believe, not LBNL, from NREL. If you're interested, I can, I can provide you the reference. Um, that's exactly what they find. They look at solar energy and they study different east-west orientation and tracking devices. Um, but even with tracking solar, you don't get away from the fact that there's winter and there's night. And uh, that really hits hard. So even with a tracking device that perfectly captures the sun when it's there, you still get a value drop that's much steeper than for wind, for the simple fact that the Earth rotates and sometimes you're not in the sun. So the key takeaway is you may have to say that uh, penetration is uh, value. But if you do have a intangible any conflicts between the stakeholders, because from a policy designer or a wholesale market, spot market, price designer, they see the larger the penetration, the value may come from. But on the other side of the spectrum of the stakeholders, which is coming from the vendors or the investors, this is completely conflicting. How do you see that conflict and what is your message to our business? Thank you. I mean, that's, that's very true. Um, and I try to sort of introduce that softly when I say, well, what is a good market design? What's a good energy policy? That, of course, depends on your perspective. And of course, if you, when I say it's good that tenders squeeze the profit margins of investors, that's not, not how investors see it. They would like to make a good living, and fair point, I also want to make a good living. Um, but I think this is what policy is there for. I think policy should do what's best for societies, and that means try to get the cheapest, reliable, low carbon, low emission carbon uh, electricity supply that, that is out there. Um, and of course, that implies that there is a lot of fights with interest groups that lose. And this is the renewable energy industry that had, support, had received more, more generous support. And that of course, that's the conventionals that also try to keep the new competitors out of the market and they lose their jobs and, they, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, stakeholders lose their money. And of course, of course, this comes with political conflicts. And of course, this will stay with us for the next years, decades to come to, to fight that through. The fact that market value is dropping into penetration is the main driver of this drop, the fact that it's variable. Yeah. So that's what my first question. The second question is, have you applied this model to more stable uh, sources of renewable energy like uh, hydro or geothermal? And what was the value drop or is the value drop in action? I'm going to be short because there was another question and then we, I think we need to, to go to coffee break. Um, well, if if you have a source that's perfectly stable, which would be a, a base load generator, let's, let's believe a thermal, a geothermal plant that you can turn on and off, it's just producing all the time. Then by definition of this metric, it would be a horizontal line at, at one. If you have a, when we talk about hydro, hydro is not only less variable, hydro is sort of, I, I would say it's negative variable in the sense that you can dispatch it, it's flexible. In a sense, flexibility is the opposite of variability. And the base dot plant that is neither variable nor flexible is, is sort of the middle ground. So a hydro plant has a value that's higher than one. It's above one. You start in, in Scandinavia, we did the model exercise for a Swedish um, client, for two Swedish clients. Um, so this, the hydro value factor starts at about 1.1 or 1.05 or so. And then what happens if you add wind power to the system? which is variable, the variability of wind power 
increases the benefit and increases the value of the flexibility of hydropower. So if you go up with winds, then the wind value goes down, but the hydro value goes up. So the idea would be, one idea would be to marry the two sources. Yeah. So, so this, is, um, this is why, I mean, this is also what, what I'm personally interested in. Um, this is why, um, this is what you saw here in orange. Um, these are two studies that we looked at. What we studied was first marrying wind power and hydropower, and second, looking at a different turbine design as two options to help keeping the system high value. Last question. We are only talking so far on one side of the equation, but how about the demand side? We do some kind of modification, let's say, on the lifestyle or some habits of some of the stuff of the people. How would that affect you? I think sort of lifestyle changes that would just lead to more or less electricity generation overall wouldn't change the message here. It would just sort of make the system larger or smaller, but the characteristics of the system would not change. The ratios would not change. But if you make changes that make demand more flexible and responsive to prices, that would help wind power. So we talked about uh, uh, um, flexible heating based on electricity, but you can also, of course, think of e-mobility, cars that only charge when prices are low, at least some of the cars, and that would obviously help the picture and help, help renewables here. Um, we haven't studied that numerically um, because we couldn't find a way to, to get to reliable assumptions. Uh, um, how flexible are cars and how many are there, e-mobility. Um, but the trend is clear. With more flexible demand, you would get less value drop of wind power. One very last short question, and then I deser you deserve coffee. Uh, one question around the value side of the equation is how you actually define value. So, so if I'm from Australia, I need your coal producer and value. Yeah. So they going to set that value equation very differently. So maybe you look at it on a macro scale. Yeah, I'm very happy. I don't need, I don't need to fight uh, the political discussions in Australia against the coal industry. Uh, that's a, that's a tough one. Um, value here is defined pretty easily. Um, so for every hour, I calculate the electricity price, and technically speaking, that's the marginal of electricity demand. So that's the increase in total system cost if you increase in a particular hour, in a particular hour, the electricity demand by one megawatt hour. That's the electricity price, the marginal marginal cost, you would say, and marginal long-term cost. Um, and that does not factor in a lot of the things that you said. It does not factor in potential macroeconomic uh, effects of employment or taxes and, and so on. That's a, that's a very sort of clean textbook micro-definition. <laughs>